everyone. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Meet a Changemaker. We are here at Carry Imagination with Karuma Grant, who is basically revolutionizing how we teach children. Uh, yeah, join us. And it's very much with the idea of children's museums. We call it a hub for innovation and learning because what we do here is to create the kind of environment that we believe children can become or develop all these skills and capacities to become change makers. So it's always play-based learning, always hands-on approaches, always problem solving, a lot of promotion of creative um, and critical thinking. So actually what's happened today is we've had the camp. The camp is, is, is one of our biggest programs we do. Um, it's a paid program because we are social enterprise. And what we, um, I'll give you an example. So the theme for the camp is mad scientists. So the children have been creating all kinds of mad things. Last week they used robotics and um, comic books, and they did a whole bunch of STEAM activities to kind of you know explore this idea of creating you know, you know crazy sort of ideas. This week they're using um, coding. No, I'm sorry. Beat making, so we had beat makers here. Um, this really amazing inventor, some of these inventor that's here, and of course our activities in the maker space downstairs, to again explore this idea of crazy creations and invention, but also thinking about inventions in a wider space in terms of sound. Yeah. Um, we also have here programs for parents. Um, we have programs, so here we, we have children, we have programs for children from six to 14. The majority of them are about 6 to 12. Um, it generally is a paid space, but we have a lot of programs. For instance, we work with um, about 30 to 45 young people who come from the village that's right back here. and They've been here since day one, so they come. So for instance, when we do pay program, we just participate in the paid programs. So it's very hard for you to see the difference between them um, and the other children. Um, one of the things that we also do here at Career Imagination is we do children's exhibitions. Um, but our exhibitions are built with and for children. For instance, here's, an, here's one of the exhibitions that we've done. Um, this was um, a project that we did um, with about 30 or so, most of them as you can see, were girls, um, from the village of Yoff. And what we did is we did an inquiry um, around this idea of of public spaces and around this idea of children's citizenship. So with these young people, we really ask the question of what is their city and what do they think of it? And so to do that, we gave them, it was a 15, 15 sessions, right? So it was a program of 15 sessions that were guided not only by facilitators we trained, but also by an architect and a, a local architect and a local photographer, videographer. And what the kids did is they did interviews, they did photography, they understood how um, architects work, they, you know, how they map out places. Um, they talked to a lot of people in the community and then they came up with the idea of what they want to change in their community. Um, and based on that, we created, in our exhibition space just behind you, we created um, a little mini city. So I can show you that footage if you need to. And what happened is other children came into the space and there was like a big block area, right? Where they'd move around and they could create their cities. At the same time, we also exhibited um, the photos that the children took. So these are the photos that the kids took. There's some over there as well. Um, we also exhibited, we exhibited also the films and the interviews. It was a real multimedia space, so it was really like a very. And we're very proud to say this exhibition was part of the Dakar Car Cour, which is um, an annual event where different cultural and art galleries participate in um, a week long exhibition, like organized exhibition. And this was uh, the first time we participated in it. And we received a prize from the, well, we, received, we were shortlisted for um, the European Museums Association has a prize for Children's Museum and Children in Museum. So we were shortlisted. So we'll find out in October if we won. In fact, we're going to Germany to find out if we fly. 
So if you have any connections, now would be the time to vote. We call us eight, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, so that's that's what we do here at Current Imagination. Um, Imagination Africa, so the larger organization, is really um, very concerned with the ecosystem. So if you will, it's great to work with kids, and I think all these programs that work with children are great. Um, but one of the things that we've realized is that's not going to bring the kind of sustainable change we need. Um, particularly here in Africa, we've got to change systems and we've got to change our beliefs and the paradigms that are holding up how we think about children. So um, from about 2015, we've begun to work um, Imagination Africa um, with different ecosystems. So our approach is now an ecosystem and really working, um, looking at institutions, looking at communities, looking at public spaces, um, looking at the social values, and really working with the media, really working with the tech sector, really working with of course, public officials, really working, of course, with institutions and schools, um, and of course, parents and health workers, to really begin to, one, define what a child is, so we can redefine that together, what the potential of a child is, and then two, really begin to see how do we really reshape environments to better support, because we understand there's nothing really wrong with children, it's really the environment that are not supporting um, their best development. So that's what we do as um, um, there. And with that work, we work not only here in Dakar, but we work outside in two regions, in Kolda and in Tamakunga, which are the southeast of it. So now you guys get to have done the spiel. Well, let's go. Yeah. When I came to Senegal, um, so my mom's from Senegal, that's how I ended up here. Um, and uh, myself and my husband we moved back here. Um, deliberately, and we came as teachers. And so Sharif, even the founder of Impact Hub, like all these brilliant people, um, I was just so like enamored by just how smart they were. We had been working in education, um, in educational administration, and I think we were just really overwhelmed by the potential that we saw. But the thing that I noticed uh, first and foremost is that um, it wasn't that sense of creative confidence. Right, which is now we all agree. Like now, this is a common term. Yeah. You know, whereas you know we've got all this potential, but that idea to yeah, I'm gonna try. Like it's great. Entrepreneurship is now the big thing, right? But that idea of I'm gonna try, even if I fail, I'm gonna try. Um, I didn't see that um, being exerted enough by all these brilliant, brilliant young people. And sometimes I remember being in other spaces where people were decidedly less gifted and still being like, yeah, okay, let's go, let's try this. And, you know, not being uh, there. Uh, when I left teaching, I got into the world of personal development and transformational leadership training. And I could see where many of the institutions that were dedicated to African development, so a lot of our international NGOs, um, a lot of our private sector companies, we had that same reticence to try. And when I could see what the educational processes, when I could connect it to these educational processes, I realized that our educational systems were really designed to make you smart, but to take out any kind of confidence that you needed to be able to apply all that smart. Um, so, even though you were involved in some of the most beautiful abstract thinking on mathematics or application of historical facts, there was no way that you could use any of that to kind of really practically solve how do we put a well <laughs> into a ground for community members that don't have, like, you know, big forklifts or so forth. Um, and so those were the things. At the same time, I was also noticing that children who are outside of traditional educational system, the competencies they had. So um, on a personal trip with my family, we went to the southeast of the country, and I saw children who were like three walking with their parents, you know, working on these banana plantations. And just the knowledge that they had, um, understanding that they had all this knowledge, but that the minute they entered into the school system, the school system was going to ask them to do this. Like, can you read? Right? And in this case, can you read in French? Right? So, what were we going to do with all this knowledge? But hey, the kid has no knowledge. That's what our educational systems are based on, is we give the kid knowledge. 
So because we give the kid knowledge, it's better for us to think as a kid as a blank slate, and then that justifies it. So um, for us, for me particularly, one of the things that I saw is that when we start cutting that social emotional aspect, and we make learning purely a cognitive academic act, there's absolutely no way we can be kind of the whole people that we need to have the kind of leadership that Africa deserves. So that's why we came here. Other than that, I don't know why. I don't know why we did this, but that was it. That was it. So whoosh, there we go. Because what happens, even I think to extent, even I think in the West, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you get picked as the smartest in your class, right? And once you get that label, right, it stays with you. You're the smartest. So you think being the smartest means I should be able to solve every problem that comes my way. But some problems are not academic problems. Some problems require social emotional skills. They require communication, they require how do we collaborate, and those are rarely skills that are taught or reinforced or even celebrated in traditional academic environments. So what do we do? We come up and we've just been smart, right? It's like, yeah, all right, give it to me. And then life knocks it down. You're like, nope, it's all right, I'm still smart. I'm still smart. Let's go. Life knocks you down. I'm still smart. But now you're like going like this. And finally you're like, no, I'd like to get a nine to five job. I'd like a really good salary. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But even when you're in those spaces, you're still not fully self-expressed and you can't contribute to that organization the way that organization needs you to control right because we know even the biggest companies are trying to create co-creative environments with their employees right we understand that right but no we're not doing that instead we're like in spaces like okay who's the smartest in the class what'd you get like here in Senegal it's over 20. 20 over 20. Hey, was not a great student he was not and i remember the teachers used to be like oh Oh, what are we gonna do with him? And blah blah blah. And I remember thinking, like, gosh, well, this I guess this really is a problem. But then his father was like, Sharif was making films, he was doing all these other things in ninth grade. Do you understand? Like, if a kid is making films in ninth grade, clearly his problem is not. You know, his problem is not the school. The school is the problem because if there's no space for him to express. All those strong literary, you know, applicants. I mean, he should have been, we should have been pushing them more. You know, totally that there. But it's again, this very tiny definition of so, yeah. Don't worry, you come back. It's really good that we started um, with something nice. Um, because it allows us to really rethink the environment. And one of the environments that we really rethought uh, was the use of local materials, recyclable materials, um, which is why we call ourselves Imagination Africa, because we'd like children to imagine Africa differently. Um, so that when we look at things that we want to call waste or impossible or there, if we can reframe it and put it in a different paradigm, that's where creativity starts, right? That ability. So that's that's what we do here. We take all kinds of recyclable materials and ask children to problem solve with them. Um, we've done a variety of different projects. I mean, I mean, we've done in years past like anatomy. We took uh, live, not alive. We took like sheep hearts and sheep brains for children to understand that there. Um, we've built robots, and we've done all kinds of STEAM activities um, with children from 5 to um, about 5 to 14 um, that have been here in this environment, and that's why it looks so well loved. And loved. <laughs> Are you curious as to how like this fits in with actual like going to school? Um, so. For us specifically, the programs that we run here are programs, um, again, as a social enterprise, so they're available on weekends. Yeah. For the children who are at Yo, many of them are in these programs on the weekends or in holidays. For other children whose parents send them here, it's on weekends or on holidays. Okay. But again, when we work with adults, you know, so for instance, when we work with institutions, 
one of the things we do with institutions is to really work with them about how do you create these kind of environments, yes. what sort of the underlying thinking and reasoning and paradigm shifts that allows these kind of spaces to be developed, what are also um, the ways we maintain these spaces, because that's a good thing, how do we facilitate these spaces. Um, so that's how we do it. We've been very lucky that we partnered with a variety of different schools. So sometimes schools come and visit and will come and do, you know, activities with us. Um, we've also worked um, with, you know, individual children who come, like from, um, there's a shelter for homeless boys, and there's just different kinds of associations that work with children that are not in school, formal school systems, to come to do these kind of activities. What's very interesting is that our Saturday program for the children in Yacht is almost in the local language here, Wolof. Okay. So, you know, that's the other thing is, is how can you kind of get children thinking, quote unquote, scientifically um, in their own local language, right? Because that's a huge paradigm shift, right? A lot of knowledge that you want children to acquire is in another language. How can children kind of use the language they have and they know intimately to express the knowledge they have and then also to you know kind of build and create um so yeah which means that sometimes you know we hit school systems but you know i feel like we're at the breaking point of school systems i think it's really interesting you all are here now uh, did you guys see sobel yes right so sobel will tell you right something like 15 percent of the young people who presented for the national exit exam. Oh, yeah, that they didn't pass. They didn't Fifteen percent passed. Yeah. Can you imagine? Fifteen yeah. percent. Like, that's crazy. That's like a catastrophe. And it's gotten worse. So last year it might have been like twenty six percent. So you're talking about like clearly almost like a ten percent in one year? Like what are we gonna wait to? What are we gonna wait till next year? When yeah. are we like what? Four percent? Yeah. And then what? Like, what is the breaking point? We've passed the breaking point. Like, clearly the system is not working. What else should we be doing? Um, but, you know, I think we think children are expendable. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is our menuiserie um, space, uh, woodworking space that's there. Um, so when children have woodworking activities, this is where they're using the space. I don't know what happened here today, but... Um, a lot of the children also, we give them a lot of free time. So, um, you know, children have different kinds of learning needs and different kinds of, um, not all children can follow everything at one time, and particularly during the summer camp. One of the things we let children do is play in our play spaces and also come to spaces where they can still have that creative work, but maybe it's on their own terms, because yeah. we're not a school. Yes, I did read about that. Could you speak more on that? Because I read that you tried to um, not uh, help them to create for themselves how they want to learn. Yes. Yeah. So one of the things that we do is we use guiding questions to guide whatever the inquiry is. Um, we'll see inside the learning one. But the idea is that if you can ask questions, um, how can children do that exploration? And how can we facilitate that exploration? It's not an easy uh, process at all. Mm -hmm. And you really do, I think, have to ride the line of like, okay, how are we guiding inquiry versus how do we just want to tell children, okay, now we're doing this. Um, but it's a very, it's a beautiful process because um, I'll give you an example. In a space like you have where the kids were making beats today, the beat maker space, the children can meet something and then use that as a form of communication as opposed to being fixed on an outcome. The process is really what you want to support children yeah. through. So we try not to be so outcome driven, which also messes those of us up who are, you know, you no, know, I was top in my class, you know, I was like A or I was 20 out of 20 or whatever, you know, because sometimes our processes were invisible to us, right? And it's not about the result, right? We knew how to get this kind of result. But when we're trying for different kinds of results, we don't always have a diversity of processes to try, right? And that's what sometimes messes us up because we keep, you know, what was it? Albert Einstein said, um, 
you can't solve a problem in the same way it's been created. You'll never resolve the problem. The answer lies on a different level. But there we are. We're trying the same thing. Let's hit our heads. Come on. No. We're going to get it this time. Okay. You got it? Yeah, we're going to get it. And what happens? So with this process, there's a way in which questions that children can use can help them decide, okay, what is the process I'm going to try to go and get? this kind of knowledge, or I'm gonna solve this problem. And particularly with young children, yeah. it's wonderful because none of that is articulated yet, and they're just doing it, right? And they're just trying and trying and trying until they get a solution. So if you're facilitating that process, that's when you can support them with language, you can support them with all kinds of ways for them to actually understand this is what learning feels like, and you can validate what learning feels like. Learning is not a result. Learning is uncomfortable. Learning sometimes is really about curiosity. Learning is about taking breaks and reflection. So once we can kind of move to that paradigm of being learners, you know, that's so much richer for all of us. But you know, as teachers, right, and us adults, it's better if we control things, I'm telling you. It's a, it's a much better outcome. <laughs> this is all our play spaces. You know, so much of the environment is magical, we don't take the time to explore for children. Yeah. You know, I don't know why, but we don't take children to fire stations, we don't take children to, you know, to markets, we don't take children to these places. It's almost like, okay, yeah, you gotta live here, tough it out. You know, but as opposed to saying where all the wonder is, how these things happen, what's going on in it, where's the math, where's the science, how do we unpack all of that for kids? So that's what we try to do with sort of our place spaces here. So these are graffiti artists. We've done a lot of work with graffiti artists because they just have a wonderful way of um, viscerally expressing things for children. So when we worked on the sea, this was the seascape that they put for children. You see the turtles. They look a little better than they did the other day. The so boat that they created. every single one of these things, the children have like touched the paint and like oh, drawn even stuff. Oh, more than that. Oh, I mean, they probably sketched it out with oh, them. Wow. With this, yeah. they worked with a local carpenter yeah. to understand what is sort of the mechanics, what floats, what doesn't float, the tires. They were involved in putting them together. Um, all of it. All of it. And then what happens is it becomes great place spaces. For them to do their imaginative play afterwards, right? Okay, so Karima, you yeah. seem like a creative person yourself, and <laughs> and um, you, I can imagine that you are the one that's coming up with the program, or how how does what is that process? What does so, it look like? For I you? think we we've developed um, an approach. Okay. Um, and this approach is very much based on inquiry and, and looking at how learning happens and creativity. Um, but what we do now is really, we've been very lucky to be able to standardize this approach. Um, so to look at how does this approach uh, trends, um, how does this approach expressed through um, environments? Um, how is this approach expressed through facilitation? So we spend a tremendous amount of time with our staff here, really training them. Um, a lot of the work that we do when we're talking about ecosystems, we train other teachers how to do that. We've got a lot of really amazing partners um, that we go in and we train with them about how do you take this approach. Our approach is also based on an understanding of how children learn and develop, so it's very child-centered. So it's um, really also not just being creative, because I think sometimes even as creatives, we have our own issues with control, right? Like, truth be told, many of us are control freaks, right, about yeah. the creative process. Um, but with children, what's creative to them and what's creative to us, you know, can be very different. So based on where is a two-year-old in their development, and creativity for a two-year-old is much higher and much more expressive than it is for my age. So how do we look at where the child is based on where, you know, where the child is developmentally, and then how do we say, okay, you know, what's the inquiry we want this child to be on? So yes, um, it was I think um, something that I was very lucky to. Um, 
be surrounded by a lot of people who are thinking about different ideas that we could really be influenced on to come in with our approach. We were also really very lucky to have a lot of people who helped us to pilot it and test it. Um, I've been extremely lucky that since this space in particular has opened, um, I've had amazing teams of, of people who I think have co-created alongside. Um, but at the same time, I think you can't ever take out the fact that we've had many great ideas and then children are like, that don't work. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, you know, let's think about it. So again, it's a co-creative process with children. Um, one of the things that I tell my staff all the time is like, well, how do you know it's going to work? That's my favorite thing is how do you know it's going to work, right? Okay, we can only work if we observe children in the space. So I'll give you an example. This is our kitchen. And again, mm. you see it's all locally made material. There's nothing fancy. I'm sorry, all the pots and pans are put away. If you'd seen it earlier, you've seen all the amazing food they created here. Um, but it's in um, these kind of spaces that you see where children are creating. And that lets us know what's working, what's not. Um, one thing we try to do also, too, is to really validate local and realistic things that children um, see every day. So as opposed to getting like, you know, no offense, but you know, a beautiful kitchenette set from yeah. the local toy store yeah. is really just going to the market and buying the same things that they see their parents. I mean, you know, clearly things that they can manipulate, but you know, smaller pots, smaller pans that they can use. And really watching how children use those things, really observing where children are, what kind of play they're doing, helps us to also be able to say, okay, what's the next thing? How would we, you know, provoke this thought more? How would we provoke this reflection more? And I think that informs as well so much of what we're doing here. No, I'm, um, let's see, let's see I'm sorry, sorry, I have a question now. Please. I don't even know how to ask it. But I remember that when I was a child, I was never allowed to go into the kitchen. I was really? told that it's a dangerous place. Do not touch the knives. You cannot use the glass yeah. plates. You're only using the plastic ones. Don't go next to the gas or whatever. And I can see here that you were teaching them how to cook already. But they, they know it. I mean, I don't know about you. But I think yeah. one of the challenges of modernity is that um, we've created, um, and I think it's been necessary to create childhood, right? I think that's a whole yes. other discussion. Right? This is the question that are we, like, in a sense, are we teaching them to like grow up too fast, or, or like, no, I, I don't know. Children, I don't know. I think the point of any child. I think first of all, we've got to stop um, inventing childhood yes. and look at children. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We yeah. have like our fantasies of what a childhood is. And it's yeah. so very much linked to who we were as children, okay. right? So what yeah. we did or didn't have as child, this is what childhood is. But if you look at children, children want to do what? They want to be functional. You know, they want to be competent. You know, this is the thing. So they're always trying to exert this competency because we also silently tell children, you're not an adult yet. You know, because first of all, you know, we, we, we're really very condescending. We look down on them all the time. You know, we don't take them there. You know, one of the phrases I've heard somebody say over the years is that children aren't the future. They are co-citizens, you know, which is a huge paradigm shift. Because if we say to the future, it's like, oh, they'll be validated when they're adults, right? But if they're now with us, I have to take their reality in, right? Just like around the world, we're looking at different ideas about identity and gender. We're all questioning those things. But if we can look at children and say, wow, you know, you're two. And you're a person at two. So let me respect you at two, right? That makes it very different. So what does a two-year-old want to do? They want to be independent, right? After a year of being at the beck and call of somebody else. They can walk, they can see themselves. Do you think they really want to follow you? No, they want to be able to do that. So how do we take that seriously? You know, um, for some people, and again, I don't like to pass judgment. For some people that does mean, okay, let me get them a little play kitchenette or something like that. For us, we think that child is watching, has been watching, They've been here in Africa, you know, most likely maybe on the back of their mother, somebody cook. That child has a whole bunch of knowledge. Again, the child is not empty. 
has a whole bunch of knowledge. How would we know what the child knows? Right? Most children, it's amazing. In this space here, children know how to make soup. They know water is the basis of soup. Right? They know if they add too many things, it changes the consistency of soup. That is a very basic chemistry science lesson. But we're going to pretend that they're going to get to, I don't know, fourth grade, and then we're going to be like, hi, we're going to teach you this theory now <laughs> about density and, you know, whatever else. I was clearly not good in science, so, you know, you might want to erase that. But, you okay. know, do you understand what I mean? Yeah. So, again, we create this modernity, and for a lot of us, I think also, too, um, you being in the kitchen was a sign of danger, right? Because particularly for many of us, you know, in Africa, we've had all these traumatizing, conflicting identities, right? So if we were successful, our children should not be in dangerous spaces, right? Kitchens are dangerous, right? Fires are dangerous, gas yeah. is dangerous. So I'm a good parent, yeah. right? My children are not there, right? So we've had all these conflicting messaging about our parenting, about who we are, about what our children should be doing, that it's maybe a little out of whack. And I think for us, again, that's why it's really interesting to work with communities, again, to work with media. I have these kind of conversations about what are the paradigms we're choosing. That's all. What do we want to choose? I don't care, really, if you believe kitchens are unsafe for your child. That's you and your child, right? For me, I know kitchens are a site of a lot of mathematics, a lot of science. I am not going to let my child touch a fire. But I know my child has watched me figure out how much water to rice. Right? And I know those are powerful mathematics lessons, you know, he's going to acquire later. Am I going to show him from the kitchen? Or am I going to say to him, while you're in the kitchen, this is how you, you know, you stay safely. This is how you keep yourself safe in this, in, in this space, you know? That, by the way, is our Ken Kairi. It's our hardware space for very young ones. They get to touch and manipulate and slide and so forth. Um, which they're generally not allowed to do. <laughs> Lucky for us, right? Um, our, this used to be our housekeeping area, mm -hmm. but now it's the doctor corner because the children who were coming for the camp were just so very interested mm -hmm. in doctors. They were playing doctors with the babies. And so, again, um, with the facilitators being very responsive to it, mm -hmm. and we designed the space. So. Those are the doctors. I don't know where the doctors are. They just left the patients. We're still working on empathy. <laughs> I'm sorry, baby. Mm -hmm. Of course, right? They just left you. You learn about food and all these things, and you learn about uh, different professions and so mm -hmm. on. And you see it in a picture, but you're actually bringing it to life for them to so, touch. But I think mean, that's the thing, right? Yes. Why? I don't understand why we focus on. It's like we rush to abstraction. Like mm. we're worried that we won't mm -hmm. get there, mm -hmm. you know. And the thing is, is now we know with neuroscience that actually the brain is working much, much deeper, much wider at you know between zero and five. Yeah. You know. So why aren't we giving children concrete, real things? You know. And then we want them to be real people, right? Like yes. across Africa, everybody wants their child to be a lawyer, a doctor, yeah, maybe a banker. Maybe, you know, but lawyer and doctor are the two, right? Sure. Um, For me, it was also engineer. Well, engineer. How could I forget engineer? Yeah. yeah right? <laughs> but those are the top three, right? Yeah. Lawyer, doctor, uh, engineer. And so what do you need to be a lawyer? You need excellent verbal skills, yeah. right? Do you, most of the language, the brains, um, let me say this right. So most of the capacity of the brain, right, the synapses that are built, that are dealing with language you built in that first year before a child can talk, mm. right? All right? Let's think about a doctor, right? Doctors, it's a very, you know, it's this very scientific approach, right? Problem solving and empathy. Again, children are engaged in these processes already, right? Before, too, they're already engaged in these processes. And again, this is what research is telling us. Engineering, that's building, man. Like if you don't have the blocks, I do want children to build, you know? And, you know, these are nicer blocks that we got lucky partners gave us. But even the boxes, you know, children are always trying to construct and figure out and see what works. Um, that blue thing we built over there is a ramp. 
Yeah. And the little boys and girls, they love just to take their car, boom, you know? Yeah. They're testing that theory. It goes down fast. What's going to happen? It's done like storytelling nights and astronomy nights. And we even did, so we're lucky. This place has a pool, right? Yeah. <laughs> we're really lucky. We've done so many events with local fishermen because you know we're in a fishing village right it's up there yeah and so the fishermen are just great they just i don't know why they're so patient with us but they come and they bring fish and they'll put them in the pool and they've like done spear fishing which you know the kids love yeah right so oh, we've God. done like um we've done that as part of our core programs for very young children but then we've also done um one family event where they were doing that and all the kids were sort of lined up with their parents with me and saying, how does fishing work? What kinds of fishing? What different wow. kinds of fish? You get to ask them a question. What is it you want to do? I have no idea. That's great. I've never said that to anyone, but, wow, so for him, I thought I'm okay. <laughs> Sorry, Thomas. <laughs> we'll talk about you afterwards. Sorry. <laughs> but no, I have no idea. For a very long time, I was telling uh, an interesting story that I wanted to be a lawyer. And then when push came to shove, I didn't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> and my parents were like, no, you told us you are going to be a lawyer. No, we had all our plans. I know, baby. I know. <laughs> I know, I know. Your parents were just like, whoa, we're tired. Here we come. And then you're like, nope. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I did um, law school for, uh, I think it was uh, two weeks, and I was like, yeah, this is not working out, so I then decided that, no, I want to do psychology, and um, we went in through the process, and uh, I got to school, I got accommodation, and all these things, and I'm almost like, no, that's not going to work, uh, you'll, not get, you'll never get a job in this economy doing psychology. And where were you? Where were you? Well, in Kenya, Kenya? the time, yeah, originally from Kenya. And then afterwards, uh, I got called by the government to do human resource management. Mm -hmm. So I went and I did that. And um, then I went to Berlin to do my master's in international HR. And then I did that. Then I was working for a while. But I think I still have no idea what it is that I, I want to do. Girl, it'll find you. Yeah. I mean, I hate, I hate to be like this because I feel like it's a little um, condescending. But... Um, this present state of where I'm at is so much um, the confluence, the final confluence of so many different strands. Do you know what I mean? So at one point it was like, I was working in education, and I was like, a writer, you know, I was writing books, and I'm still going to write my books, I still am, I'm coming back there. Coming back, I promise you. <laughs> but there's no issues there. <laughs> no trauma there. Um, but it was just the confluence, and so when you, get to that point where these things start and I think that's that's the power of creativity is also too where we're in a space now and it's very hard for us I think those of us particularly in Africa it's so very hard for mm -hmm. us to be like you know, I gotta trust what you know you look at our economies you know yeah even in Europe you know let me tell the truth right? but you look at our economies and it's just like you know and our parents who've done so much for us too you know um, my mother, who, you know, been in the States for 15 years, like, I don't know why she's so nice to me and so supportive, because I should be now being like, oh, what? Come, retire, I have you, what is that? You know, you're going to Thailand, you're going there. But she's just, has been so supportive, so I don't know why. I think it's because I named a child after her, that's probably why. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, there's some real reasons why it's hard for us to negotiate. But I do think the world is changing at such an amazing pace um, that there's so many conventions and, you know, that it's hard to stand in uncertainty. And I think that's where we're also trying very hard here at Imagination Africa to do is to say, it's not uncertainty that you're standing in, right? You're standing in yourself. So that no matter what's happening, you're able to kind of negotiate and navigate through that, right? Because the world is shifting, right? Like, it's great to think about lawyers. We do need lawyers. But we know that the scene about law is becoming so much more complex, right? It's now you have, you know, corporations that are standing as entities. You know, now you have these multinational corporations. So where are you going to try them? So, you know, it's these things 
are changing between us. You know, we have to have new kind of minds. So maybe you don't know now, but you probably will know in about 10 years, right? And that's when, you know, we'll see you again. Like, don't say it. Dulce, we were here. You didn't know what you wanted to do then, Dulce. Do you remember? Now you're on stage, girl. Dulce! Oh, <laughs> do you also do, um, did you ever do coaching or psychology yeah. as part of I your did. ministry? I did as my transformational leadership. Yeah. And that's when... Um, <laughs> Actually, I don't know if we have the time. Maybe you could tell us a bit about the journey of how you <gasps> to to. Thomas, how much time do you have? How much it's digital, right? It's got a I lot of battery. I was going to ask these questions, otherwise. So. It's right. You got a lot of battery. I'll tell you. <laughs> so, I started out. Um, I started out, um, you know, very unconventional. I had to leave uh, university early. Um, which was a blow for me. It was real trauma for me, but uh, you know, financially I couldn't afford to finish. And uh, I went to work in a trading company on Wall Street, right? And I was like, hey, make that money. But I was miserable. Um, and my mother has always been, again, she's from Senegal, but she's been working in Harlem in early childhood for you know, at least 40, 40 years now. Um, and she was like, why don't you come? Why don't you just come and work in there? So I got my start in early childhood. And it was absolutely one of the most devastating times um, in, uh, I think, in urban history. It was a time when communities were really reeling from crack cocaine. Um, and so there were just some really absolutely devastating uh, consequences on young children and their education. Um, but for me, I think one of the things that I learned from that experience is one is the resiliency of children, two about the way you can't separate children from communities. So you can say all you want, but you know you focus on a child like you better take into account his parents, his communities, the economic systems, right? So all deeply entwined. Um, so when I left there and I was able to go back to school. Um, I ended up um, studying anthropology and really studying um, culture. Um, and again, really always having been supported again by my mother um, to express myself creatively as a writer. So I'm um, being involved in a lot of those communities. Um, I got into community-based organizations. I worked a lot with community-based organizations and some really beautiful um, people, you know, the generation I come from, I won't tell you my age, but the generation I came from really were very much about, okay, we're going and we're giving and our creativity is really going to birth so many things, right? Including hip hop. Um, but as a result, I think there wasn't a moment again where creativity wasn't a fuel in my life. Um, I got married um, and I had a child and I made the deliberate I did to stay home with my child. Um, when I went back into the workforce, I worked in educational administration. And then we decided, myself and my husband, uh, 16 years ago, to, to move back to Senegal. I had always known Senegal. I absolutely always have dreamed of coming to Senegal. I've visited Senegal since I was a very small child. My mother's family was here, so it's always been a very um, intimate space for me. And as a child, I was also very lucky that my father um, who was not Senegalese, but he had, uh, he's always worked around the continent. So very early on, I think I was blessed with sort of this pan-African idea and really this sense of like, are you kidding? Africa's like the greatest place in the world. Like, you know, everybody else was like, I remember growing up in New York, people were like, ah, African Haiti. Like, those are the two words you never want to talk to, right? If you were Haitian or you were African, it's like, oh, oh my God, you're right. You were black, 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 shh, shh, don't ever say that. But I knew, and I was just like, I'm not telling anybody. <laughs> like, believe what you want. Like, I know these are amazing places to be. Um, so I always knew I was going to come back. When me and my husband came back, we came back as teachers um, and went to the school and had this amazing experience. Um, when I left teaching, I worked with a lot of schools, again, um, really new schools. Um, founding them, helping them to put together different kinds of academic programs, sort of social-emotional programming. Um, I got my master's and um, 
went on to, you know, sort of work a little bit in higher education. But at the same time, I got trained. I got this amazing training in transformational leadership training. And I was blessed. My trainers were African women, one from Nigeria, one from Ethiopia. So there was never a moment where Africa was ever defined to me as like, like it was always a foreign idea that Africa was impotent, we couldn't do this or that. It was really always more like, are you kidding me? Like you just gotta figure out how to solve it. So the transformational leadership training that I received, and there was even another woman who was again, um, she was originally from India. Um, you know, all of this very powerful ideas about who we are, who we're being, how are we showing up, how do we affect systems, why change? Well, all these ideas that I think really found um, a really wonderful um, way for me to put them all together. So, but they were all different jobs, right? Until one day I couldn't take it anymore. And I was just like, oh, I do something. Um, and the pilot project that I had started, um, I was like, okay, I called some women up and I knew and it was just like, hey, let's, let's put together something. And I think that's where Imagination Africa came. Uh, I think for so many, you know, I have a lot of friends actually, they're all sort of like, hey, you did something with yourself, didn't you? We didn't know that. <laughs> no, but don't you worry. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm joking. I, I've really, all my life, been surrounded by people who have just been strangely so supportive. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it, it was really these different strains, but always believing in yourself. Always um, trusting in yourself. The hardest lessons, my biggest defeats have been about realizing that it's not so much about the brain and being the smartest person. We talked about that before. The biggest defeats have always also been about when your ego gets in the way. Um, really trusting in processes, right? So all these things that, you know, strangely enough, trying to create for children, how do I do that for myself? Um, also really learning um, a lot about uh, accountability, you know, so really showing up you know for yourself and your dream um and really being there and really not being afraid to fail you know that failure um how do, how do you want to define failure okay what you know i've had some low points where it's been really hard where you know you've got to pay people salaries and you know <laughs> you just don't have um, the money and you know you have people working with you just on the strength that they believe in you um but at the same time it you know, really understanding, okay, you know, how are you going to be accountable to that? You know, how are you going to show up in ways that you can support people viably? Because I think many of us in Africa, we also have really great dreams, but there's some real economic realities. So, you know, we have a team here, and so many people in our team, you know, they have, they've got to pay for their kids to go to schools too. Um, so I think those those are those have been the battle and really realizing that times where it hasn't turned out the way I've looked, that hasn't been a failure. That's actually been an extraordinary learning. And if I can get my ego up out of the way, and you still get to cry, right? You still get to cry, you still get to like and when you can, you know, move past that grief phase to that second phase when you can be like, okay, what did you learn? You know, you learn maybe to think about things before you do them first. I don't know, Karima, that could be a thought. But you know, when you, when you learn um, those kind of aspects of things, um, you can be a lot gentler with yourself. You know? Girl is hard. Thomas, you got issues? Oh, he can't talk to you. Sorry, Thomas. <laughs> got issues. Oh, I just had to laugh because he said, that could be a thought and you know. It's it's so true, you know. It's all these thoughts popping up, and you say, "Well, let's you know, try. there could be another thought." Let's you know? go, right? Like, it just, let's try it. <laughs> you know, let's go. My husband used to say to me, "Got a lot of imagination, right? Because imagination Africa, but you don't have a lot else." I was like, "Oh, what do you mean by that? <laughs> what are you trying to say to me?" <laughs> you know, I get so offended, and I was like, "Oh, he's actually right. Maybe I could try it a different way." Um, but yeah, I, th I think it's. I did coaching for um, a lot of times in the transformational leadership um, 
it was amazing and I, and I find that again it's that idea of like the human journey you know the human journey and we do it all over the world but like in Africa it's almost like you know we have to skip the human journey and, you know become super Africans right like, save the continent do this do that do that um, when you know sometimes it's it does require and I think and again I say this very humbly I think for your generation um, we've got to get off the paradigms that we're imposing you know I think there's so many I am so excited sometimes when I see like the work that's happening again I, you know I give the example of two or three people you might have met here some of them have had stellar academic career and they've really done but a lot of them they've been some really they've fallen into what they've done you know and that's amazing like I think I've even heard Sobel tell that story like in school like he went to like a great school here you know but you know you have to um, first of all the hard-headedness that trust in yourself you know that that faith in that little voice in your hand you, you gotta really build that in place and sometimes it's really hard you know you know it's really only recently that I don't have like my my old physics teacher in my head telling me oh you can't do that <laughs> you know that just got him out I think maybe like an hour ago <laughs> before you guys came <laughs> I don't tell you about my math teacher but you know but I'm serious, you know, we have all those things competing in our heads so that it's very, very hard for us to trust when things um, are colliding for us to, to create a path. So just be good to yourself, girl. Plus, do see, look at what you're doing. You're traveling all over Africa, right? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Manage it. I wish you all would talk to the woman who's our interim program manager. She's from... England um, and she's bite from London here and she's going down to South Africa she's amazing you know but it's like you know the world is now this place that we have to create you know it's not it's not set everything a lot of things that we've accepted look it's all up in the air now how are you gonna tell somebody what they are you can't even people are choosing even their own pronouns now so you know who am I to say yeah all right engineering you know it's, we've got to be thinking differently that's, that's why we're here and even the planet the planet's like oh really you get to act up any way you want to all this you know emissions and so forth and i have to stay still no no <laughs> you take back a part of that land you know so i think it's, it's really a shift that so like I talk too much. I, talk I love that. Thank you so much for sharing all this. Oh my gosh. Anytime. Is now does the real interview begin? Oh my god, I know because I talk so much. I didn't let you interview me. I'm just gonna be quiet. I'm just